Hello, my name is Charlie Card. My brother Jim has for a long time been interested in foreign language. The idea of being able to communicate through different forms fascinated him, as he saw it as one of the most unique characteristics of the human brain. After having studied French, he decided to continue the challenge of learning a new language by practicing German. Although he can speak German about as well as I can speak French, what fascinated him was how fast he was able to learn this new language. He has been learning German for almost four years now, and I have been learning French since I was in fourth grade. And we are still on the same page. Jim began to wonder what it was that made language acquisition so easy for some and harder for others. He began to realize through his research that it is not merely the ability of the learner, but also the circumstances in which the language is learned that determines success. His experience in using the online tools of Rosetta Stone brought more ease to the process of learning German and thus increased his retention. This inspired him to find out why. To tell you more about the process of learning a new language is my brother, Jim Card. Wir sind die Erbauer die von Kommunikation, die das Konzept nicht erkennen, dass es nicht mit anderen Arten die soziale Komplexität machen können. Ce discours présentera la vérité de l'acquisition de la langue, de qu'il révèle la magnificence d'un tel pouvoir humain de communiquer avec une telle complexité, while trying to help answer the question of why. During the last 40 years, much research has been dedicated to explaining how and why humans can construct and comprehend such a complex system of communication. In the United States, the population of those who can speak a second language is much lower than that of its worldly counterparts. Unlike other countries, it is not a necessity to be bilingual in order to survive in our English-based society. As a result, the United States educational systems have continued to demote their emphasis on foreign language. The consequence of this is not only depriving students of linguistic and cultural knowledge, but also depriving them of the cognitive benefits of being able to speak another language. Research has revealed that bilinguals are more developed in terms of cognitive processing than their monolingual counterparts. Therefore, despite the many concerns that exist currently in our nation's education system, the concentration on the improvement of foreign language education in primary and secondary schooling will greatly increase both higher level language learning acquisition and the abilities of students on an interdisciplinary level. The efficacy of the methods currently used within the majority of the United States educational institutions can be evaluated through a statistical standpoint to be a fairly ineffective effort. Compared to the 56% of Europeans who are bilingual, the United States falls short at only around 18 to 20%. But this can be understood, as the United States has become a monolingual society with English showing its dominance in the culture, government, and economy. This figure of 18 to 20 percent has actually increased over the past few decades from an initial 11 percent in 1980. However, it may be fair to presume that this increase may not be due to the fact that our education has produced more bilingual individuals. As it can be seen, the immigration rate of Spanish-speaking demographics has increased relative to the increase in bilingualism. If this is true, why is it then that students are put through a language curriculum that has not yielded results? One reason may be the lack of emphasis the United States as a whole has put on the importance of foreign language as a subject. In a study conducted by the National Council for State Supervisors for languages in 2010, 29 of the United States' individual education systems were analyzed through their state legislative education reforms and current re regulations on the level to which each system emphasized the inclusion of foreign language into graduation requirements. Through observation of the data collected, it was found that 70% of these states did not emphasize the role of foreign language in state public school education requirements. The baseline requirement 
among most states was found to be two years of a foreign language class and not always in the same language. Beyond this concern with baseline ed language requirements, there may lie other weaknesses that need to be addressed with the methods of teaching currently outlined for teachers in the US public education system. For example, a document of guidelines was produced by a collaboration of literature and linguistic specialists at the University of Oregon on the most effective ways to teach a foreign language. And this document was widely distributed to high schools in the United States. However, Stephen Krashen, a linguist and professor at the University of Southern California, surveyed this document and found this document and found it did not provide the best pedagogical advice in areas including listening comprehension, grammar, speaking, and writing. Krashen pointed out that the convention that produced this document did so without the professional opinions of educators or psychologists on language acquisition. Krashen declared that the outlines in this document, quote, led to pedagogy that conflicts with research and theory published in professional journals over the last 30 years. It has been reported by the Center for Applied Linguistics that the amount of class time spent using the target language has increased. However, this does not act as compensation. As the CAL still openly states that in the report that there are continuing concerns with the language programs of the United States. The key elements of language acquisition are therefore hindered by the unprofessional guidelines laid out for teachers and their inconsistency with what recent research has shown to be the most effective methodology. One form of education that has been a step in the right direction for the United States in the establishment is the establishment of dual immersion institutions. These education programs have 50% of the classes taught in English and the rest taught exclusively in the target language. These forms of education are used in many parts of the world to prepare students for the globalized world in which they will become a part of. In the United States, these programs are seen as a way of assimilating children from different linguistic backgrounds into our English speaking environment. The goal is to teach children in a way that is comprehensive to them while also preparing them to interact in the English speaking world and understand its culture. There are some parts of the country where these dual immersion programs are available for native English speakers to learn another language. They exist in small numbers in states such as New York, Washington, Idaho, Delaware, and others. My cousin Willa is a part of this unique, ex unique form of education. Starting from the age of five, she was placed in a dual immersion school in Sun Valley, Idaho, where she was taught in both Spanish and English. As can be seen by the transition of this chart, Willa's fluency in Spanish has increased dramatically as the use of Spanish on a regular basis increased as well. Dual immersion curriculum may present itself as the evidence solution to the issue that seems to surround students' lack of proficiency in foreign language in the United States. However, there is another aspect that must be accounted for in order to fully understand why such methods have not been implemented. It is not pedagogical, but sociological. As stated before, the linguistic homogeny of the United States gives the implication of the dominance of English within our society. This may be characterized as merely a flaw in the mindset throughout American culture, but it is in fact the basis for legislative action. In 1994, Ron Unz, former gubernatorial candidate for the state of California, sponsored what became known as California Proposition 227. The purpose of the bill was to educate limited English proficiency students in a speedy one-year transition program that quickly assimilates foreign, foreign students into the American education system. In other words, the proposition eliminated all bilingual classes that allowed immigrant students to retain and use their native language as it was believed to be doing more harm than good. To highlight the arguments made by the opposition to this form of education, let me direct your attention to a brief debate between Mr. Unz and Teresa Bustillos, along with other political voices on the subject of this proposition. You 
have the students that are immersed in Spanish. It's not bilingual. They teach the subject matter content in Spanish for three or four years before they begin to get into the Some English. Some of these kids end have been it. in the courses for five and six and seven years, and there's no improvement. How do you know immersion will be better? Well, it's the method used in every other major country in the world that has a large immigrant population. Germany and France and Britain and Australia and Canada and Israel all teach children the national language as quickly as possible once they begin school. None of them use what we call bilingual education. So the current system is just a dismal failure. The children are not learning English today. And in fact, for Latino children who don't know English in elementary school, approximately 70% are in these Spanish-oriented programs. And Latino immigrants are the one group given a lot of bilingual education, and they're one immigrant group that does worse than all the other immigrant groups, because the others are taught English, while Latino children are taught Spanish. Ace, do you think if this passes tomorrow and the polls show that it might, that uh, it'll have implications in the rest of the country? Tremendously so. Half of all the bilingual programs in the country are in California. They're a dismal failure here. If they end in California, I think they'll be reconsidered everywhere else in the United States. The first thing that must be acknowledged is the lack of familiarity of most in regards to what must be expected from placing a child in bilingual education. Parents immediately become concerned when their child is falling behind in subjects such as reading and listening comprehension and moving at a slower pace than children in regular English-based schools. They also become concerned when their child is not speaking until around the age of five or using speech patterns different than their monolingual peers. The immediate assumption is that the program must be responsible for the student's struggle. This assumption is absolutely correct, but not for the reason one may think. According to Raising Bilingual Children, delayed speech is a consequential part of raising a child bilingually. This is because it takes more time to subconsciously identify the rules and words of different languages than simply for one language. Comprehension comes before expression when it comes to the development of speech. Secondly, Ons is incorrect to state that other countries do not have forms of this dismal failure. Three students of bilingual education were interviewed to gain a first-hand perspective of what it was like to be instructed under such conditions. Two of them had been educated abroad. The first example is a student from Jordan who learned Arabic and English simultaneously in, a dual, immersion in dual immersion classes from age five. Arabic ma was mainly used in his social life and English composed his learning environment. After fifth grade, every one of the student's classes was taught entirely in English, which compartmentalized the, the languages he used between his academic and social life. When he moved to the United States, the student underwent a linguistic transition in which his knowledge of English was out applied to not only his academic life, but his social life as well. Notice that although the student underwent a transition to where English was used more often, he was still able to retain his foundation of Arabic. Another example of this type of linguistic development is seen through a medical student from Lebanon who not only once, but twice underwent an experience of linguistic adaption. Having been raised to speak both Arabic and French from kindergarten, Dr. Roy Habib was prepared to attend a French-speaking university in Beirut to attain his degree in medicine. After having graduated, Dr. Habib decided that it would be more beneficial to practice medicine in the United States than France. He already had studied English on a less extensive level, but he, but he still had to linguistically adapt to English when he came to be a hospitalist at Lewis Gale Hospital in Roanoke. And like the previous example, Dr. Habib has retained all his knowledge of French and Arabic while using English on a regular basis. In regards to the debate, the argument is completely oblivious to the advantages that these children have for being bilingual. It is not merely the idea of being able to further understand different cultures in a more comprehensive way or gaining a greater appreciation for mankind's diversity. It is because although the learning pace of dual immersion students may initially be slower, Research has shown that children who speak more than one language later find learning new material easier. 
The reason for this relates to why the assumption that bilinguals undergo an absolute transition between languages is false. The reality is that for bilinguals, each language is constantly active while the brain filters out every word or rule that does not correspond to the language being used. In other words, axons are constantly at work discerning what language A is and what should be ignored as language B. As a result, this extensive neurological process requires more attention. This is proven by increased activity that has been measured in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the region of the brain associated with attention and inhibition when bilinguals are asked to identify an object in the second language. There is also increased activity in other areas of cognitive control, such as the anterior cingulate cortex, bilateral supramarginal gyri, and left inferior frontal gyri, all being supported by a greater average rate of blood flow through the neural stem. In addition, new technologies in neuroscience, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI scans, have revealed the cognitive benefits of being bilingual. In a comparison of bilingual brains and monolingual brains in fMRI scans, a quantified difference in brain structure was discovered. On average, more gray matter is present in both bilingual, it is more present in bilingual brains along with more white matter present in both bilingual children and adults. This difference in structure, along with the more effective use of the brain's resources, can be evidence for the assumption that students learning proficiency will be, great, will be greatly increased in not only language, but in any discipline of academics or daily life. There is another advantage to speaking a second language that goes beyond the ease of learning. A more profound advantage that has been inferred from being bilingual is defense against dementia. Tom Schweizer and other specialists conducted a study where 200 bilingual and monolingual individuals with Alzheimer's had the extent of their symptoms evaluated. It was found that, quote, bilingualism appears to contribute to increased cognitive reserve, thereby delaying the onset of Alzheimer's disease and reducing the severity of its symptoms. This research has shown that there is a more universally applicable advantage to language acquisition than simply a communicative one. As previously stated, although these benefits continue to justify implementing dual immersion into our education system, such goals are simply out of the question, as they do, are not the most practical solution at this time. Therefore, we must focus instead on ways to reform the current methods of instruction so that they are aligned with what researchers have proven to be most effective within a classroom environment. Two theories can be used as the foundation for an effective teaching style. Krashen's comprehensive input hypothesis, hypothesis and the survival instinct theory. Comprehensive input states that language is understood when it is strongly associated with an idea or image rather than just translations. The survival instinct hypothesis implies that language is acquired by the human brain's instinctual motivation to understand and communicate within its environment. Using one or both methods require a continuous use of the target language in order to work. Think back to the beginning of this speech where I was addressing you in a different language. Think about how much of that you understood. That was lesson number one. Here is lesson number two. Das ist mein Hand. Verstehen Sie das? Hand? Gut. Und neben mein Hand ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Sie verstehen Kopf? Gut. Und mein Kopf hat Augen. Wie viele Augen? Eins, zwei, Zwei. Zwei Augen. Drei Augen? Nein, das ist nicht richtig. Wir haben keine anderen Augen. Es ist nur zwei Augen. Und unter meinen Augen ist meine Nase. Nase. Ja, verstehen Sie das? Nase? Und unter meiner Nase ist mein Mund. Mund. Und ich kann mit meinem Mund Deutsch sprechen. Ich 
if you understood what I just said to you in lesson number two, not every word, but more or less, I, through Krashen's methods, was able to teach you the basis of German in less than a minute. Could you repeat everything I said back to me? Probably not. But nonetheless, you were able to understand what was going on, which is the first step to language acquisition, not speaking. In terms of teaching methods, first language use is often seen as an area of uncertainty. When is it acceptable to use the first language of the students in class? According to Krashen, quote, comprehension hypothesis does not forbid the use of the first language in the second language classroom. It does, however, provide guidelines. For instance, if there is a word that is central to the subject of a conversation and it cannot be efficiently explained in the second language, then, it can, then a very quick translation can be used to make the discussion more understandable. It can also help to reduce anxiety among students, which, according to Krashen, is one of the essential parts of making sure that an affective filter is not present during the learning process. An affective filter, in essence, is the response a student makes to a situation in which a task is believed to be too difficult for them to accomplish. It is used in order to not overexert one's intellectual capacity over something that is not relevant to what they truly need to know. To verify whether or not these outlines based on Krashen's, meth Krashen's research are in fact a step in the right direction for language pedagogy, one must confirm if these methods are coherent to the way humans understand language. Although this is a process that is very complex and still not fully understood, Francois Grosjean and Ping Li, co-authors of the Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism, have outlined the most credible theory of the process of language comprehension. Take a simple phrase such as, the window is closed. As you can see, this process is very complex and hard to follow. But the principle that we can take away from this is that language comprehension has to do with the environment from which the input is heard. This is relevant to the idea of comprehen comprehensive hypo input hypothesis because environment is a sensory factor, just as an image or idea is. We perceive our environment the same way we perceive our thoughts and imagery. All of this information goes to show that we have recently come to the understanding of how language is acquired. Now is the time that the United States take all this information about language and use it as the basis for a transformation in the way we teach language. We as a nation do not have it easy in terms of language instruction. Our country has for centuries had English as a standard form of communication. And English is becoming a universal medium throughout the world, which makes it harder for educators to justify the, um, the emphasis on bilingual training. However, the argument for international social skills is only one side of the coin in bilingualism. If we can increase the intellectual capacity of every student by teaching them to understand something their minds are evolutionarily designed to comprehend, we will have taken a great leap forward in developing the next generation of learners. Let this not give the impression that those who are bilingual are intellectually superior to those who are not. It is simply from statistical research that we have seen a greater cognitive ability demonstrated in those who speak more than just one language. If this is true, let us therefore take advantage of this discovery by giving every child the experience of language immersion. As Benjamin Franklin said, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Thank you.